Connie Brown Collins of Voter Rights Network of Wyandotte County. I'd like to welcome all of you here to our Veto Session Community Convo. For those of you who don't know, Voter Rights Network of Wyandotte County led the redistricting fight to keep Wyandotte County whole in the third congressional district. We went all the way to the Kansas Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court with the legal expertise of the ACLU, but we lost. But we are still fighting. We continue to work to follow legislation that impacts Wyandotte County, mainly at the state level, on voting issues affecting minorities and other human and civil rights. We weigh in and make our voices and perspectives known in many of the areas that we will discuss today. As we begin, I'd like to go over a few items that may guide our session. First, I have to stress that we are committed to nonpartisanship in our interactions today. Many of us have organizations and partners who are 501c3s and who risk their nonprofit status if we are partisan in our discourse. Please show respect in this area. We will not be able to entertain questions from the audience that are determined to be partisan. All of our interactions this afternoon are timed. We have a lot to cover in a short time frame, so we will stick to a pretty strict timeline. Uh, we'll have allotments for our speakers so we can move through the program and give each topic area its due. We're asking anyone who has a question in the audience to write down your question on a note card. The note cards are on the back table there. We have a couple folks who will collect those note cards throughout our session and we'll take a pause after a number of questions have been asked to stop and ask questions from the audience. If you don't feel like writing, just raise your hand, raise your card, and someone will come. Uh, a couple of our monitors will come and write down your question for you. We may not have time to answer each and every question, and then again we may, but we will do our best. We're going to be trying to live stream this, and we'd appreciate you keeping it down, not talking during our discussions. We'll be happy to send out a copy of the recording afterward if you would like one. This is a community education event. We're asking everyone to respect each other, no matter your viewpoints. Finally, I ask that we work to treat everyone with dignity and courtesy. Just a few housekeeping items. Feel free, we have coffee in the back. We have pastries, uh, cookies, snacks. The men's and women's restrooms are out the door, past the elevator to the left. Feel free to come and go as the need arises. We won't have a break, so if you need to stretch your legs, if you need to stand up, just quietly. I want to acknowledge also and thank some of the organizational sponsors and partners who helped make this convo possible. Uh, Mainstream Coalition, Kansas Black Leadership Council, Noreen Spears, Barbara Eichert, and other members of the KCK NAACP, UAW Local 31, and other friends and supporters. We thank you. We have several topic areas that will be discussed today, and these are either on uh, Governor Kelly's desk in the form of bills, or they've recently received her veto or signature and been sent back to the legislature for further work or a final vote. We have a wonderful panel of experts, experts, legislators, and leaders today who will speak to us about several categories of the bills that are currently being reviewed by Governor Kelly. These areas are public education, LGBTQ plus rights, reproductive rights, and our last category is everything else. <laughs> our agenda and program are on the sheets that you have if you picked one up in the back. Uh, we'll proceed through the topics with questions from our moderators, our elected officials, and our experts. Those on our dais, if you would like to provide an answer, please pick up the mic, which is in the middle of the table. Um, if you feel comfortable, stand and uh, say your name and your affiliation or your district. And there will be a two-minute time limit so that others can jump in and respond if they choose. 
After several questions, after we go over several questions, we'll have a brief audience Q&A, then we'll resume for several more questions and another audience Q&A. Before we dive into our topics this afternoon, I'd like to introduce our very esteemed moderators. We have two, one is running a little behind, but I will now introduce Denisha Snell. Denisha is a Kansas City native, a facilitator, a moderator, a producer of public programs, and a cyclist. Currently, she is a facilitator for the Parent Leadership Training Institute of Kansas City and a consultant working with organizations in various capacities. Denisha has worked to publicly address parent advocacy, cultural diversity, school choice, health disparities, economic impacts of community health, violence prevention, and building relationships with community and civic partners. Denisha. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Okay, excellent. Um, I wanna start by thanking Ms. Connie for calling me and asking me to moderate today. I am grateful to be here and grateful to be with this panel this afternoon and the rest of you that are in the room today. Um, I want to start off by doing some brief introductions of our panelists and then um, I will ask you all to give a brief two minute um, introduction of your subject matter area or legislative area in light of the veto session that's coming up. So with us today we have Melanie Haas board chair of the Kansas Board of Education, District 2, that includes Wyandotte School Districts, Bonner Springs, Edwardsville, Kansas City, Piper, and Piper, Turner, and Johnson Districts, Blue Valley, Olathe, and Shawnee Mission. We have Tom Alonzo, who is the board chair of Equity Kansas and second district rep, UG Advisory Committee, Commission on Human Relations and Disability Issues. Tori Gleason, who is a chiropractor, clinical analyst at Lawrence Memorial Health and master's, Master of Public Health student graduating on the May 23rd with an epidemiology concentration at KUMC and member of the trans community. Courtney Vincent Woodbury, who is the Vice President of People, Culture, and Equity with Planned Parenthood of the Great Plains. Senator Ethan Corson, District 7, Kansas Senate, Northeast Johnson County, that includes Fairway, Leewood, and Park, Mission, Mission Hills, Mission Woods, Overland Park, Prairie Village, Roland Park, Westwood, and Westwood Hills. We have Representative Melissa Orpesa, Representative District 37, Kansas House, Wyandotte County, Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas, and Park. And we have Michael Popa, Executive Director of Mainstream Coalition and Mayor of Roland Park, Kansas. Lastly, we have Senator Dinah Sykes, Senate Minority Leader, District 2, which includes parts of Lenexa, Olathe, Overland Park, and Shawnee. Welcome to everyone that's here today. If I mispronounce your name. <laughs> All right, so let's start off with, um, I want to give each of you an opportunity to give a legislative overview um, in light of the veto session. So if one person wants to grab the mic, what we'll do is give you guys an opportunity to pass that down the table. Um, our timekeeper here is right in the front. Um, oh, are you oh, I, am I starting? I, any, <laughs> any one of you can start? I've been voluntold to start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is this on? Yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you very much, Anisha. Uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you to Connie and all the other partners for putting this together. And, and most of all, thank you for, for being here today to find out more about the veto session and what you can do, what actions you can take. As Denisha said, I'm Michael Popa, Executive Director of Mainstream Coalition. And uh, we have our uh, member engagement and advocacy coordinator, Jay Moyer, here with us today. And our role during veto session, um, well, our role during the legislative session is to engage, inform, and then give tools to voters, uh, to people of Kansas, to advocate for the issues that matter to them. Uh, we were founded about 30 years ago, actually 30 years ago this year, uh, on the premise of uh, keeping the separation of religion and government, right? Well, over the years, 
our body of work has grown because so many bad pieces of legislation come from uh, muddying that separation. As you can see from the bills that we'll be discussing today uh, during veto session. And as Connie mentioned earlier, veto session is when the legislature comes back to then um, uh, either take up the governor's vetoes and try to overturn them. This year is a little bit different. I'm sure uh, Senator Corson uh, can, can talk to this. Uh, he, he was talking to me earlier. They have a lot to do. They still have to pass a budget uh, that was line item vetoed by the governor. Plus, there's pieces of legislation still hanging out there that they'll be crafting. So there is a lot to do this year. Uh, they still haven't passed any type of K-12 budget either. Um, I am going to yield the rest of my time to my uh, friends here on the panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Thomas Alonzo. I'm the chair of Equality Kansas, chair of Northeast chapter of Equality Kansas, and I'm your second district representative to the Human Relations Commission of the Unified Government. Um, Equality Kansas is, was created back in 2004 by combining a number of different regions in Kansas to address LGBTQ plus issues in the state, the first one being, the major one was marriage equality. And Tom Witt, some of you may remember Tom Witt, he just retired in November. He was uh, responsible for getting all those groups together and forming Equality Kansas. And our main function is to ensure that the, the issues of the LGBTQ plus community are addressed in the legislature. We do a lot of work behind the scenes, on the phone, uh, talking with legislators. This is my first year as a lobbyist, so to speak, in the state house, which is a real eye opener. And but know everybody that we are the primary advocate for the LGBTQ plus community. And there's a lot of stuff like Michael said going on. Hello. Okay. I'm not going to use this. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So my name is Courtney Vincent Woodbury, and I am the Vice President of Equity and Community Relations at Planned Parenthood Great Plains Votes, which is the advocacy arm of Planned Parenthood Great Plains. And part of my role today is to represent Planned Parenthood and the patients that we have in Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and in Arkansas, and specifically speak about anti-reproductive health bills that misinform and stigmatize abortion care in the state of Kansas. And so I am happy to be here today and I'm happy to address um, any questions that you all have regarding reproductive rights. Now I don't know if I should use this I'll hold it anyway. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Melanie Haas. I represent District 2 on the Kansas State Board of Education. That list that you wrote was a little more extensive, I think, than where my district actually okay. covers, but I'm sure it's not your fault. Okay. Um, no. we, I'm actually working with a new map as of January. Yeah, as of January. Um, so my district moved from being entirely in Johnson County up into Wyandotte and now encompasses all of Turner School District and about 90% of Kansas City, Kansas School District. And then I represent Oh, kind of two thirds of Shawnee Mission School District, and then moving south, um, I've got the top part of Blue Valley as well. It used to stretch all the way into Olathe, but it shifted north up here. So, um, in January, my peers, my my nine colleagues on the state board of ed, um, elected me chair, and so I'm currently serving as a chair as well. And this is my third year on the state board. Um, the Kansas Constitution provides for the state board to exist. And so we sit at a very high level and are responsible for general oversight of schools in Kansas. And so the legislative session and the veto session that accompanies it is important to us because we kind of play this game where we're asking them to stay out of our lane because as a state board, we want to be the ones responsible for making decisions about what needs to happen in schools. Generally, the state board is responsible for now I've got the numbers, so I'm going to get messed up. Um, we're responsible for teacher licensure, accreditation of schools. Um, we cover graduation requirements and state standards. So we tell schools what they need to teach, not how they teach it, not what the curriculum is. That falls to local boards. So your local board is elected, and it's 
really important because they're also there to represent you. And so that's kind of the, the distinguishing factor is we oversee schools, we're watching this session closely because we want to make sure that the legislature is not in our lane and they're not in the lane of local boards. Hi, I am Senator Dinah Sykes. I represent District 21, not two, um, but no worries there. And I serve as the um, Senate Minority Leader. Um, and so we are going into veto session and I've served in the legislature for seven years and this has been by far the worst session that I've been a part of. Just, uh, we had a vote on August 2nd on women's reproductive rights where Kansans overwhelmingly talked that um, this is not the government's issue, we should stay out of um, the position and a woman's choice to provide, but we've had bill after bill um, trying to take away that right. Um, LGBTQ, um, continuing to attack the trans um, community on every possible thing, whether it's in prisons, in um, bathrooms that they use, um, in beds, on school field trips, and in sports. So it's really been a horrendous attack there. Um, school, as Melody was talking, uh, we have different lanes, but again, we veered over to both the state board and the local board um, on multiple times and bills. Thankfully, the governor has vetoed and we have been able to stop some of those bills in the legislature. Um, we do have the budget to um, continue to focus on when we get back. There were so many things that were put off until omnibus. So normally we have a budget that kind of funds um, and state employee um, pay raises. Um, Medicaid expansion was in the governor's proposed budget. Those are all taken out. Um, there is a lot of community services that um, increase funding that were good parts of that, but overall um, it is lacking in so many areas. And then school funding, um, more than 50% of our budget is paying for our schools and we have not addressed that. And um, by the looks of it, when we kind of adjourned, the votes were not there to pass the bill that has been in conference committee. So, we will, and knowing that the governor will probably veto that because it has some really bad policy base. So we have a lot um, to address in the next three days and it'll probably be a little over three days once we get there, but. Awesome. Um, okay, uh, Ethan Corson, thank you so much for grabbing me here. My district starts just on the Johnson side of the Johnson Wyandotte line, so it's really good to be here. Um, with friends in Wyandotte County. So uh, Connie asked me to talk about a couple issues that may not be getting quite as much attention or we may not be able to talk about in, in an individual segment, but it's kind of some odds and ends that I think are still important. Um, what is voting? And, and this is actually, I think, a bright spot. We had actually looked at proposals and had passed early in the session, at least out of the Senate, a proposal to ban ballot drop boxes which I think would have been really devastating on folks' ability uh, to vote, both in urban areas like Wyandotte, but also in rural areas where driving to polling places and things of that nature can be really cumbersome. So we were staring that down earlier in the session. That, that, that has been dropped, so I think that's a real positive. Um, we did pass uh, a, a ban uh, elimination of the three-day grace period on returning advanced ballots. The governor has vetoed that, which is a great thing, and it does not look like they will have the votes to override that veto. So it looks like that three-day grace period, which is really critical in the 2020 election, that was 20,000 votes across the state that were voted on or before election day, but were received in the Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday after the election. So I'm really pleased uh, about those two developments. And then Leader Sykes talked about the education budget, and one thing I would just flag in addition to, to watching the, the general K-12 education budget is what we'll be doing on special education because we know that that's such an important piece. I represent the Shine Mission School District. I'm sure the numbers are really staggering in Wyandotte, but we lose $8.1 million a year in Shawnee Mission that we're paying from our general fund and not getting reimbursed by the state for special education services that we should be. Hello everybody, I'm Tori Leeson. 
Um, I'm actually new to Eastern Kansas. I spent most of my life in rural America, uh, technically a frontier county, so uh, they do exist. Um, so anyway, I, I grew up in Dodge City and, and uh, spent the last 17 years practicing as a chiropractor in Goodland, Kansas, and then uh, made the direction out this way. I sat on a couple of national boards at OutCare Health as we look at policies around the entire United States that address health equity downstream, as well as midstream and upstream barriers and, and, and things that we need to work on from a policy perspective. And so Health Outcomes obviously is the only clinical analyst of a 2000 FTE hospital. It's definitely a passion of mine. I sit on KU's Behavioral Health Rule Board and a couple other boards here in the state of Kansas. And I have a passion for rural health and I always, well, you can't take the rural health out of me. And so it's, I'm honored to be up here with these uh, amazing human beings who I get to watch and unfollow on KS Ledge. And uh, I'm just excited to be here to, to really answer any questions I can from my background um, in, in terms of complementary health or in, in regards to health outcomes, um, how those policies affect and what we see from, uh, um, I guess, downstream issues for our patient populations and what we're seeing around the, the country. And so I'm here to be a, a resource and you can always chat with me afterwards because Jay's gonna cut me off here in a second. And so uh, anyway, I, listen, I talk a lot, Jay, you know that, all right? So we all do up here, that's why we're here. So uh, that's why I'm here. I know. <laughs> and so just excited to be part of this. And I love being in Eastern Kansas and I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be all of it. I've had that ability to leave in, live in three quarters of the state and, uh, and now live here in Eastern Kansas. It's just been a, just a, a real gym to get to know human beings out here. And I live in Olathe, work in Lawrence, and, uh, and here we are in, in uh, Wyandotte County and loving every moment of it. Um, hello, I'm Melissa Oropesa and I am a freshman legislator. Um, I am, have a doctorate degree in nursing, so that's my background. And I'm glad to hear that this is the worst that <laughs> our <laughs> leadership has seen the legislation. So hopefully it's nothing but better from here on out, at least for me. Um, it's been very interesting. It's been very eye-opening, <laughs> I can say, to say the least. Um, so with my healthcare background, um, just really delving into those types of bills that have come through, the state-mandated misinformation, which thankfully was um, vetoed by the governor, and hopefully we can continue to sustain, um, as well as several other bills. Um, hopefully she will also veto bill, House Bill 2350, which is very targeted at our undocumented and um, very worrisome to me originally when I first saw it on the floor and then the Senate language came back and then it was very obvious of where, the, where it was going. Um, so hopefully that will also, we can sustain that veto as well. Um, and yes, I'm still learning, so I will <laughs> continue to learn. And um, just FYI, I do have to sneak out a little early, so that's why I called the good spot. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you to all of you for um, for talking um, about your areas. So I want Mike. I want to. This is a reminder for those of you on the stage and for those of you here that this is a very community focused session. And so um, one thing that we always talk about when I facilitate is making sure that the community understands. We don't want to take for granted that they understand what's being said and how to talk about that. So Michael, you talked briefly a minute ago about the veto session, how that works, how this one is different than other veto sessions. Can you talk us through what that means, what that looks like, what is it, what even is this veto session in Western Care? Sure, of course, I'd be happy to. So uh, there are a couple of different um, dates, uh, important dates that signify different things uh, during regular session in the legislature. And the most recent uh, significant date was April 6th, which um, was colloquially known as um, drop dead day, right? So it's really called first adjournment. And that's when all of the normal business is supposed to be finished, right? All bills that are to be passed are supposed to be passed by that time and then sent to the governor's desk where she will then have 10 days or two weeks to either sign, veto, or do neither and just let it pass into law. Um, veto session, which starts here next week on Wednesday on the 26th, is the time, uh, as I mentioned before, that the legislature comes back into session for a limited amount of time, a limited period. It's supposed to be three days-ish, but you know, in talking with, with our legislators here, uh, it might run a little bit long because there is a lot more to do this time. So traditionally, you know, the uh, budget, the full budget, 
has been passed, the budget that includes uh, education funding, right? So half of the budget, as you heard earlier, is education funding. Um, half are appropriations in other, in other areas. Well, it didn't happen that way this time, right? Education was left out completely. And so they're gonna tackle that separately. The budget bill that went to the governor, budget bills, uh, she's able to line item veto, which means that she's able to veto sections of a bill, right? And so th she did. She vetoed sections of that bill because there were some pretty harmful things in that bill that were basically just stuffed in there. And it had to do with reproductive freedoms. It had to do with the LGBTQ community. So it, it, was, it had to do with diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism. Banning anti-racism training was in a budget bill. And so, of course, she vetoed that. And so now that goes back to the legislature, the legislature where they can, do you all take up the vetoes line by line when it's a line item? Okay, and so they, for the budget bill, they'll take that line by line, and I believe there were 19 vetoes in the budget bill. Some around that, there's a nine in there somewhere. I know that much. Um, plus, there's also some hanging legislation out there. Like I said, they haven't passed the education budget, and there's a conference committee report that the legislators can tell you a little bit more about that's still out there as well. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, Toriano, uh, our, our other esteemed moderator, has joined us. Uh, just to give him a brief introduction, uh, Toriano Porter is a national award winning opinion writer for the Kansas City Star Editorial Board. As a native of St. Louis, Toriano has called Kansas City home since 2007. He is a three-time author, a distinguished motivational speaker, and a dedicated mentor to young people in the metro area. Wyandotte County, good afternoon. Uh, as you know, uh, I wrote that bio. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what I've learned in my 48 years of life is you have to be your own advocate, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, we'll, we'll get this thing uh, continues to, uh, going. Um, one of the questions that came up was about public education and vouchers, right? And can anybody on this table, Melanie, maybe you can uh, address this. The question was, the statement in the question was, my child has been bullied at school. I'm thinking about taking him out and putting him in a Christian school run by my church. What's wrong with using vouchers, which is public dollars for private education. Can I start with me? <laughs> I imagine there are several opinions up here. What's wrong with using vouchers? So the money that we put in as a state to public education is for the public good. The concept of money following the child doesn't work because not everyone has a child. It's not as if every Kansan can go in and grab their piece of that pot of money and say, this is my money, I wanna go do something different with it. There are many analogies. We could talk about the fire department, we can talk about our roads and water. These are things that we all benefit from. It's part of the public good. So when you take your student out of a public school and put them in a private school, the other thing that happens is that there's generally not going to be oversight of that school um, at, at the state level. So there are opportunities for some private schools to become accredited. They have to apply to the state board. They have to go through a process that is similar but different from the process that public schools go through. And then you've got smaller schools, schools that may be religious or not, but they choose not to go through that process. There's no oversight for those schools. And so they're not necessarily teaching to the same level of standards, like the requirements that I talked about earlier, those requirements might not be met in that school. The teachers may have different training backgrounds. Um, and in some cases, maybe you have teachers who aren't licensed, aren't certified. Maybe we're just kind of making up the curriculum as we go, right? And so what happens is at the state level, we see those students come back into public schools they might leave to go to a private school, they come back and suddenly they're behind. A fifth grader is reading at a second grade level. They aren't, their test scores aren't what we would expect them to be. And so then we're having to work harder to catch those kids back up. And so statistically speaking, what we see 
is that a lot of those kids come back needing remediation and needing extra help, and our community suffers. When I think about the people that I see on a daily basis, whether it's the person at the desk downstairs, it's you know the people that I might pick up groceries from, everybody benefits from having a public education. And I don't know about you, but I want my money to go to educating everyone, not just the people that we kind of pick and choose. All right, great, thank you, Melanie. Uh, Leader Sykes, I wanted to ask you, yeah, what's the yeah. movement like in, in Kansas? No, I think Melanie um, did a great overview of that, but it's, not every child who they say, you know, low income or if they're lacking um, on test scores, but that's not what the process is set. Like we were trying, we tried to put an amendment in there to show, okay, who are the kids who are receiving these either tax credit scholarships? Um, we want to know that this is actually kids who are being bullied, who are not achieving well. Um, and time and time again, the legislature said, no, we don't want to hold these schools, private schools, accountable. But then you see all of the things. Oh, we have a parents' bill of rights that we passed. Uh, we want to make sure that all the curriculum for our public schools is online so every parent can look at this. If I have a problem with something in a curriculum, I can go and have it pulled. I mean, these are things that we're doing attacking our public schools, but our private schools are not held to that same standard. And they're just saying, you know, trust us, we want to take these dollars and we want Kansans to be able to get um, tax credit. And some of these um, SGOs, so scholarship granting organizations, they're actually advertising saying, find out what your tax liability is, and then instead of writing the state of Kansas that check, send it to us, and then you're not gonna be liable for your tax. So it is a concern, but it's, um, they're not saying that they would require, or that they would accept all students, which are public schools, uh, we talked about special ed, as Senator Corson was talking about, about the funding for that. Our private schools are not required to do any of that special education funding. And they actually would be getting um, private, the dollars taken away from public schools, but then they could send that student back to the public school and say, you have to do the services that they need for special ed because we're not gonna wanna do that. So it's trying to give them money, but we're holding you know, our public schools to this really high standard um, and not wanting to have any accountability whatsoever for the private. Yes, um, I, I agree with everything that's been said by, by Board Member Haas and Leader Sykes. One of the ways that my constituents, just in, in kind of more colloquial, casual conversations have expressed it to me is, and because mainstream's a part of this, I wanna be sure to, to mention this aspect of it as well, which the question went to a school that is run by a church. And a lot of my constituents have a lot of hesitation with public dollars going to directly to specific religious organizations. Yeah. And I have a lot of constituents who send their kids to private school. I think that's great. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with religious education at all, but that's typically been decisions that are made by the families a lot of my constituents have just said that our public money should be going to our public schools that are non-religious. If, if kids want to get that aspect, that's generally been something that the family has provided. And so I just think that the U.S. Supreme Court has been pretty lax in, in what they've allowed as far as public funds going to public schools, but I know that among many of my constituents, that creates a lot of heartburn. Absolutely. And we're, we're going to switch gears here just a little bit. Uh, we're going to switch to gun violence. I don't know if you guys know, but yesterday the uh, Kansas City, Kansas Police Department released the name of a 19-year-old young lady who was shot and killed. She was uh, killed in crossfire in uh, gun violence. And so it brings us to our next question about NRA training, which I believe was vetoed. Yeah. What's wrong with gun safety training? Why is it so hard to pass sensible gun laws in Kansas? Anyone can jump in. Eddie Eagle real quick. So the, the bill that you're talking about was House Bill 2304 and it requires, this is back to stay in your lane, right? So I'll, I'll tee this up for these guys. Um, the, the bill requires a certain type of curriculum for teaching gun safety. So not every district in the state teaches a gun safety class. Um, there are some rural districts that have taught these classes in the past and want to continue teaching them and Essentially, the NRA said, well, we want them to use our curriculum. So 
I have a problem with this bill because it's telling local districts what curriculum they have to use and it disallows them that they can't use other curriculum that they've probably already been using, whether they created it themselves or they purchased it from someone else. Um, I believe that this bill also allows for some curriculum that comes from parks and rec at the high school level, but for the younger kids, the NRA curriculum is what's required. And so I don't think that, you know, I, I think that they're again out of their lane because they're stepping into curriculum issues with local boards. I thought it was fascinating when we were debating this, I don't know, the seventh time, because it's failed <laughs> several times. Uh, we actually had an amendment on the Senate side. Um, every town for gun safety, they also have an arm, which is an advocacy group, just like the NRA, um, which the NRA, Eddie Eagle, is through that advocacy, and every town has um, their plan, and it's talking about um, you know safe storage, being um, you know properly um, using the gun, um, showing that, you know, respecting the gun and teaching this. So we had an amendment that in addition to Eddie the Eagle that we would also make sure that families are storing their gun safety. And it was fascinating because everyone's like, no, this is a group that advocates and they um, are a political action group and we can't have this in our schools, which was completely like all of our <laughs> um, complaints about um, Eddie Eagle. But again, it is, you know, one side um, trying to really, the NRA is trying to get in the schools to be able to sell more guns. Now, I have to ask you guys on the table, how many of you are uh, responsible gun owners? So I grew up in a home with guns. I do not have guns in my home now. So. And anybody in the audience, how many of you guys own guns? I'm, I'm petrified of guns. I haven't, I haven't carried a gun in 20 years. Uh, I, I'm scared of it. I, and I, I'm not afraid of it. But I really feel like we should have sensible gun laws. Anyone over the age of 18 should be required to have training, background check, red flag laws, all of that. But this, this is just my opinion. So you guys talked a little bit about the budget. So we're going to go back into this. Generally, this is a question that we got as we were preparing for this. I am basically pro-life and based on my religious belief. But I also believe there should be exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. How is that taken into account in the current law? We're talking about in, in this public education. I'll try this again. Hello? Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it alone. Okay. <laughs> so again, I um, appreciate the question. Um, the current law allows anyone to obtain an abortion up to 22, up to 22 weeks um, for any reason. And limiting abortion access to these very narrow exceptions puts a heavy burden of proof. And those that, um, a heavy burden of proof required to receive care under those exceptions. And last August, Kansas voters overwhelmingly stated that they wanted to protect their reproductive rights. And any laws and any restrictions that um, limit abortion access, subvert the, the will of the voters. And so we have, to, um, we have to be very vigilant in making certain that we do not support legislation that does the very thing that we as Kansas voted not to do. Um, and the last thing that I will say that when it comes to bans um, in any abortion restrictions, it does disproportionately impact um, black women as well as other women of color. Right. And I know that uh, there's been a series of bills filed this year. Fortunately, your governor has, you know, did what she needed to do to veto. How does that impact your work when the people spoke, but yet legislators are still trying to subvert their will, as you said? How do you keep doing that work, Courtney? <laughs> you keep doing the work because Kansas deserve, Kansas voters deserve the truth. And most of these, most of this legislation is about um, promoting misinformation, it's about stigmatizing abortion care, and it's also about um, limiting the rights of people's health care. And so as long, I mean, part of the reason why we continue to do this work, right, is because everyone has, um, has a basic right to, um, to health care, and that's what we're fighting for.
Hey, Melissa, I'll, I'll throw you in this conversation. You say you're a rookie, you're new at this. How has it been seeing uh, all of this uh, uh, attack on women's rights, even though Kansas voters affirm it? Um, so for me, um, I am a healthcare provider and had to learn um, on the ground running because this was not my area of expertise. But this is definitely um, state mandated misinformation, which then also comes in between um, a person's um, healthcare as well as their provider. We don't need that third person in the room. I already have to personally as a provider deal with the internet and having to combat that misinformation on a daily basis in my own practice. So then also having legislators jump in there that have no background in this type of health care or providing this type of health care or even promoting anything that's even remotely research based is um, amazing to me, <laughs> to say the least. And so um, I've spoken against all of these bills when they came up on the floor because even being a freshman legislator, I did my research. I went up there, I offered fact data, I offered research data, I offered data that was actually comes from the state of Kansas. A majority of abortions in the state of Kansas as of 2021 were at six to seven weeks. And that is out there on the KDHE website. It doesn't go into any great detail, but I mean, that's again, it's very early. It's between a person and their provider. And just knowing that that's, um, if any of these were to pass, it would be unfortunate Absolutely. for healthcare. Absolutely. And one of the great things about community forum is questions from the community. Mm -hmm. And we do have a question for you, Melissa. Oh. <laughs> and we, you spoke about uh, House Bill 2350. Yes. At, in masquerade as an anti-trafficking bill. But can you talk about the unintended consequences of that law if we can get Governor to veto it and then sustain it? Okay, if we can get uh, Governor Kelly to veto it and then we can sustain it, the unintended consequences are, is um, there's a specific line in the bill that says should have known, and in, in, in reference to should have known their um, immigration status. So we do have mixed households that uh, people are here, and if you offer a ride to a cousin, a family member, and then they give you gas money, you would be under a felony five violation. Um, so that is an everyday uh, occurrence. Um, if you are an Uber driver um, and you someone happens to be speaking a different language other than English, and that comes into question of what is their immigration status. So then you'll have people thinking of these horrible scenarios and then not picking people up or not providing transportation because they could potentially come under a felony uh, conviction or be prosecuted. I mean, this is transportation, public transportation, private transportation being in mixed families. We don't want to put anybody in a situation to where they could potentially end up in jail. So yes, it's a, it's a poorly crafted bill. I think the, in, the original intent um, had some good merits, but it's just completely gone a different way. Excellent. So we want to continue with, um, let's talk really quickly, um, one more thing about public education, and then we're going to go to some more questions from our audience. So um, why isn't the K-12 education and special ed education in the budget, um, and how will public schools operate? Thank you. So I will start, and then Melanie. So over the um, past couple of years, um, K-12 budget on the House side has kind of, they pulled out this budget in the past. It used to be part of the budget, but over the last three years, they're trying to do it. So they want to put bad policy in there and tie it with funding because it looks bad and we call them postcard votes, which I think legislators are becoming more and more aware of those. But so if you vote against this, you are voting against funding our public schools. And so the other side of the aisle will use this vote to um, then send out postcards in our district saying, Senator Sykes voted against fully funding our public schools or voted against um, fully funding special education. But what they do is they tie it with horrendous uh, pieces of policy and it's trying to um, kind of weigh how far can they go with still getting 21 votes or enough to sustain a veto. And I think this year, what we saw both in Senate Bill um, 83, is that right, 83? Mm -hmm. And then 113, um, they split. So special ed funding was in 83 and it was with um, education savings accounts. 
and some other things, um, and it failed on the floor, and then we had a motion to reconsider and actually killed it. Um, I would say it was killed, but everything can kind of be zombie <laughs> revitalized. So uh, it could come back up next week when we're there. But Senate Bill 113, it had the base budget. It did not have special ed, but it had other pieces in it. So it tied our base state aid. Um, so it froze it with this year's amount. So moving forward, uh, all of our schools could potentially be losing because of that CPI index, which is um, tied to the increase to keep us out of court. That was what um, the Gannon decision was, that um, we would fully fund our schools, and it took five years to get us vote, and then each year moving forward would be based on CPI. So again, I think they saw the writing on the wall that they had put so many bad pieces of policy in there that people were not willing to um, sacrifice that. Okay, so let's, um, I, we have a question from the audience here, um, and they want to step back just a second and talk about the veto session. How long can the veto session possibly go, and what happens to bills that were vetoed but not overwritten? So it can go as long as the Senate President and the, <laughs> the Speaker of the House want it to go. And um, you will see kind of late nights kind of moving in because as legislators are sleep deprived and food deprived, and they're more willing to vote to get out of there. So that's all part of the tactics. Um, if the governor has vetoed something and we do not take it up, it stays unvetoed. Um, another one about education. If private schools don't have to accept certain students, what happens if a student or if a student gets a voucher, isn't accepted, or fails? And if a school is required to accept students, do they become public? So schools won't be required to accept all students. That's the bottom line. Um, you don't really get the voucher. Like it, it's not as if a, it, you don't get the voucher if you're not going to the school. And so um, I, I actually have a student that my, my daughter. Um, I have tried to get her into a public school a couple of times, and this. What's that? Into a private school? Sorry. Into, did I say public? <laughs> yes. Into a private school. Apologies. Um, she, she's had some challenges in her school, and as a parent, I felt like, okay, if I go down this path, I might be able to create an environment that is better for her. Guess what? The school that we applied to won't take her. She has stayed in public school. We are going to stay there for the duration, but that is a personal experience that I have had. And I know that I'm not alone. I have heard similar stories from other families. And so, yeah, just because you want to send a student to a private school doesn't mean that they're going to accept that student. I would, uh, can I add, so sure. I serve as ranking on Senate Education, and we've actually had um, administrators from private schools talk about, because I've talked, like, they have great graduation rates and all of this, and so we talk about, you know, what if there was a student who was struggling and they say we have great graduation rates because if a student was accepted as a voucher student and they're not meeting their standards, they just don't let them come back. And so that's where uh, Melanie was talking about sometimes, you know, that fifth grader who was at a second grade level. They will not keep you, even if you have been accepted, if you're not hitting their standards, they're not going to, across the board, there are several who have come out and said, we make sure that they kind of are not in our graduating class. So we're going to put them back in public school. Yeah. yeah. I would just say school choice runs both ways. It really, truly is the school chooses the student. Mm -hmm. I think people have this misconception that it's always the students who are choosing the school. It is just as much the other way of the school choosing the students. And if a school wants to say, we don't want kids with a special need, we don't want kids with dyslexia, we can't provide those sort of services, they don't have to take them. I mean, the school, the choice remains with the school, not with the student. Absolutely. Yes, Michael. It's kind of a question because I'm unclear. But so let's say that uh, you have a student that uh, was taken out of public school and used a voucher to go to private school. Well, as many times as the case, the private school will then move that student back to public school, but the funds aren't there for that student. In the same right. calendar, in the, in same the same calendar. school year, yeah. that's absolutely right. true. There, there are a couple of opportunities for double and even triple dipping mm -hmm. on this whole voucher tax credit thing because you may have a student who um, is not enrolled in a public school, 
goes to a private school, and then we talked earlier about the special education services. Well, the money's not there for that, but the school's going to be providing that anyway. Thank you so much. Okay, so I want to pivot us just a bit into LGBTQ rights. Um, so what is gender-affirming care, and why is it considered to be so dangerous that doctors can face legal consequences for performing it? I'll take this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we know why I'm here. <laughs> so, and we thank you. For yeah, that. absolutely, okay. my friend. Mm -hmm. the The idea with gender affirming care is it's so misunderstood, right? I mean, it, it, if you get on Twitter, it is it is used, it is twisted, it is it is turned into political theater, and in fact, it is just healthcare. Mm -hmm. It's not challenging. It's not hard. We all deserve healthcare, even if you're different and like me or like some of the other people. And, and we, we go to these things. If you look on the other side of that state line and you see what's happening in Kansas City at Children's Mercy, if you see what's happening at St. Louis at their children's, and you see those attempts to literally put out a, a form to say, hey, if you see something, report something, mm -hmm. as though we're worthy of being watched. Um, I'm pretty boring, I want you all to know. And most of us are. We try and hide as best we can. I don't hide very well. And so the reality is, is that gender affirming, affirming health care is, for many of us, it is therapy. It is going to a therapist to talk about who I am and how I can exist in this world. Sometimes gender affirming health care is just going out and, yes, there are some people that get blockers. A very small amount of adolescents, you're going to cut me off in a minute, this is dangerous. So, I know, just stress that a little longer, Jay, please. So blockers do exist for some people. Um, and then on to, uh, on to gender affirming hormone therapy for some people, the very minute, small of people. Here's the thing, the reality is this, in the state of Kansas, we have 14,500 people that are trans, right? There is 20, an estimated, this is 2022 numbers from UCLA Williams Institute, 2,100 youth aged 13 to 17, we have 12,400 adults age 18 and older. 14.5, can you imagine a population of 14.5 that are told your health care does not matter? And of course you can. If you have a uterus, you're told that right now. The reality is, is that our pieces and parts and the things that make us who we are matter. And I hate people that can't stay in their lane, stay out of my physician's office, stay out of my therapist's office, let me exist, let me just be. Those surgeries are not being done. And when they are, it's very small and it's life-saving. But minimally, even in Kansas City, as they've said, none. Even in St. Louis, none. And so, but it doesn't make good political theater for none. Okay, so let me ask this question from our audience. Can you please explain the implications that the current House bill will have on our transgender population in Kansas? I got to defer to you. Th thanks for the lateral. I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> Tag me in for another one. Here we go. Are you ready? That's no, a lot. Are you Two more minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Great. I like this. So me in front of a bunch of people. What what it does is is that um, we, Senate Bill 180, for instance. Well, I mean, we can go through the slew of them. But with Senate Bill 180, right? You know, now I worry about where can I use the restroom? Now I, I worry about what's my birth certificate going to be? And are we on the next step of are we now legislating or moving towards legislation of, of uh, you know, basically turning in individuals? Are we moving towards that direction? Because it sure feels like it from our perspective. And, you know, when you see things on the others, all you have to do is watch the playbook from other states in Montana, in Missouri, in Arkansas, in Texas, in Florida. Just pay attention. And the thing is, is they'll say, you're taking, that's not in the bill. You're, you're, you're taking the words and you're twisting them. Walk a mile in my shoes, my friends. Walk a mile in my friend's shoes. The reality is it's terrifying. And the reality is, is those bills, in addition to Senate Bill 180, keep me up at night. I know the statistics on those individuals, those youth. This impacts them. We had data, data to support that. This is not fictitious. This is real. When 85% of youth start having issues because of current policies that are put into place or being talked about for donors, that impacts health outcomes. We talk about structural and systemic border, uh, barriers when it comes to upstream and midstream. Those things impact people and parents. When you start discussing what it looks like to have a, an exit strategy or a, what's your bug out ba uh, bag look like for, uh, for taking your kids, and I'm privileged, incredibly privileged, that I can be up here at this table and use this seat to say, 
enough is enough, y'all. This is exhausting, and it's only going to get worse. We're over 400 bills in the United States right now that are going after us. We're really boring. My intersectionality says, talk to me about my bad parenting. Let's have a conversation about that. Not on where I should use the restroom and wash my hands, but that's where we're at right now because it sounds really good. And we know if you read any New York Times or anything like that, you know there's a strategy because they threw it against the wall and it's stuck. <coughs> These aren't issues that are discussed about at the dinner table. These are our lives you're messing with. Stop it. It's exhausting. Okay. Right. So, like to, oh, yes, go ahead. If you don't mind, I would like to add to that. As the board chair of Equality Kansas, I've had three telephone calls from people in Kansas asking me, when, when should I leave? I don't think that I, I don't think that I can live here anymore. Okay. When should I leave? And where's the closest place I can go? I'm not kidding. And then four email messages. Okay. So if there's that seven, imagine how many others are out there that are too afraid to ask that still don't even trust us. Okay. I thought it was important to mention that on top of what Tori was talking about. Excellent. I want to toss it over to some of our... Yeah, I think it's just been a continual attack, and I've had those voicemails <laughs> from constituents in Kansas, and it is heartbreaking because they are being targeted. Um, whether it's not a kid who wants to be on the track team or play basketball, and, and we're telling them they can't do that. We know they just want to be a part. They want to grow up. They want to be a part of a team learn what it's like to win and lose. They want to feel safe going to a bathroom. They want to go on a field trip, an overnight field trip to the band program and not worrying about being beaten up because they're required to be in a room with their sex at birth. And as we were talking about that in student education, I was like, you know what? There's a lot of things that are different. You know, you want to talk about their same sex relationships, but we don't care if we put two boyfriends together or two girlfriends, but we want to make sure that a transgender female is not with other females. So it is an attack and it is revolting um, because we are telling a small part of our population, but a very important part of our population, that they're not wanted. And that is not who we are. And we need to fight back because Again, it was the gay community a couple of years ago. Now it's the trans community. What is going to be tomorrow? And we need to tell people enough is enough. Kansas is a place for diversity. So would any of our other legislators like to talk about that? or Because I want to put a pin in yeah. what you talked about as far as midstream and upstream. Because I, I want the public to understand what that means as public health speak. And so, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to answer that for Tori. But I will just say I'm also incredibly boring, and I think Tori put it well. I'm incredibly boring. I ran for office to be focused on economic growth for this state. I ran for office to make sure that kids have good public schools. Wyandotte County is a wonderful place. It has a lot of challenges. I wish that your legislators were really focused on the challenges that affect your community instead of really making life more difficult for a, a small number of folks in the community. I mean. I think it's very telling that one of the most anti-LGBT legislators in the state is also the chair of the Senate Commerce Committee. Why doesn't she focus on growing our economy? Why doesn't she focus on bringing new businesses to places like Wyandotte County that could offer good paying jobs? I mean, I'm just boring and when I ran for office, those were the things that I want to focus on. I don't want to focus on telling people what bathroom they should use or what kind of health care they need to get or how they should live their lives. And so, it, to me, that just remains an incredible frustration. You know, I got a question yesterday from the Greater Kent City Chamber of Commerce. If you talk to any of our chambers, one of the biggest problems we have in, a state, in the state is workforce. And they said, what is the legislature doing about workforce? And I said, honestly, we're not doing anything because we spend so much time talking about these issues that really are just hurtful and meant to target a subset of our population. And why not have a bigger, growing, thriving, more prosperous Kansas? So that to me is just a continued source of frustration because I'm with Tori, I want our legislature to be boring. I want us to just focus on, do your kids have a good school? Do you have a good job? Are you gonna be able to retire with dignity? Those are the things that we ought to be focused on. 
Absolutely. So, Tori, I'm going to throw it back over to you really quickly, and then, Toriano, I'm going to give the mic back to you. When you talk about midstream, upstream, downstream, can you tell the public what that means? Why should they care about upstream? Um, and how does that impact their everyday lives? Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. So really what it is is that where you live, where you work, where you play determines your outcomes. And you're like, well, how much? 80%. 80% of your health outcomes are determined by those things. Those policies that are enacted downstream affect us from in the – I wish he was here to answer this. It affects that doctor-patient relationship. It impacts me when I'm running the data because I'm a nerd and I'm like, oh, this doesn't look good. And we can look at, and just in Lawrence, for instance, and I'm going to use that, I know not Wyandotte County, one street that represents the difference between 66044 and 66049, there's double the income in one for family incomes. You look at the cancer rates in one. You look at the disparity that exists. You look at those barriers that exist and the policies that are in place that keep people away from being healthy. We have got to address upstream barriers to make sure that downstream we see better outcomes. We need to spend money on a fence to protect people and not the ambulance at the bottom. Because the ambulance costs too much, it bankrupts cities, it bankrupts hospitals. 50% of our rural hospitals right now are in jeopardy of closing their doors. Medicaid expansion. Um, so um, 150,000 people in their gap, for God's sakes. Come on now, this isn't rocket science, it's just math. Math, let's, their math doesn't math, but whatever. The point is, is that let's spend time addressing those upstream policy issues. You know, as you mentioned, who's bringing this stuff forward? Brain drain is an issue. We have an infrastructure issue. We have a people issue, and you're enacting policies that are pushing people out of our state. That's not good economic policy. Let's keep people in that happen to be from historically resilient communities. They happen to be, and I like historically resilient. I'm going to use that. Christina Pacheco, JD, MPH, almost PhD. She's brilliant. Um, but marginalized, stigmatized, those individuals that are in those groups that are away, but resilient. Stop attacking those with policies that impact health outcomes at the bottom. That's what I talk about when I talk about upstream and midstream. Let's address those issues, this coalition, cross-sector. Let's address that in our policy. Let's address that in our – we see that in the COPE program, which is a $40 million program in 22 counties around the state that are addressing local issues from a cross-sector position that has community health workers, that has community-based organization representatives, and has the regular community member that says, let's identify and let's figure out a plan to identify those gaps and those issues. I'll stop, I promise. Yeah, I know on the Missouri side, um, the difference between the expected life code for someone that lives in the country club plaza area versus the third district is 12 years. Mm -hmm. oh That's based gosh. on a study by the Kansas City Health Department. 12 years difference between life expectancy. That's and we can wild. draw the same conclusion yep. here in Wyandotte County, yep. 66101 down here and 66109 out in Piper, exactly. right? Hey, we had another uh, question, if not comment, from the audience. We have a doctor, a doctor in the audience that said they would like to um, briefly expound on gender affirming care. So, if you will stand up and please uh, introduce yourself and talk to us. Well, Stephanie. Yes. I'm, <laughs> I know a few of you. I'm Dr. Um, I, because uh, it's not spoken, I don't know about enough. I've been doing gender affirming care. because as um, uh, Dr. Melissa said, they aren't based in fact. And when, or maybe I should say, um, I just hope that the legislature would open up, and I know that a, a lot of you have been trying. I talked to uh, Cindy a lot, well, Senator Hosher, a, a lot about this, uh, about having doctors to provide medical information so you do not get the misinformation and the disinformation and then know the difference between the two because one tends to lean more towards a political agenda. But uh, also more importantly is the conversation about gender affirming care is just 
is put out there and it instills fear in so many people. And it gives, it, it has set this tone that uh, physicians are taking children and turning them into these monsters. And that is not at all what happens. Um, I'm not a surgeon, but I have, or, or and I have done the most gender affirming care than any surgeon ever will. Because just as you said before, and I'm sorry, I don't remember your name of the number Just three A's. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's about therapy. And it's therapy that we all have. I go to therapy, <laughs> you know, and I am a psychiatrist. And so it is about just give, providing care, providing health care, and allowing people, children, whatever the case may be, to learn how to exist in the world that we all have the right to exist in. And then when you talk about the medication and the hormone blockers, that is not something that was created for Dr. Frankenstein and whoever else. Those medications have been out for a very long time. My daughter had to take them. I know some of you have probably seen my baby, Sanaya, but it was because um, she was born with something called precocious puberty. And it just means that she developed early. And so to stop her, I mean, she's five now, so it just lets you know, you know. We had to stop that because it meant that she could have started her cycle from the things that I observed without going into detail on her body. It meant that she could have started her cycle at the age of two. So she had to take them. And there are a lot of children that have this, but it's not spoken about. So when these things come up, the same way you can take bad legislation and tie it into a, or, or a bad uh, point and put it into a, a, a good bill, the same thing happens when it comes to ordinary things that happen every day. And then you tie it into something that you already want to create a divide and you make it fearful. And that is very dangerous because the first thing that you do when you want um, to create a divide is to dehumanize people. And that's what is happening with the trans community and that is very, very dangerous and we do not need to allow that to happen. But also with that with gender affirming care outside of the, uh, of the therapy, it is, it, it, with that existence, it's, we bring in um, um, coaches. I, I brought in my vocal coach and it's uh, because sometimes the, um, the people children, adults, whatever, uh, would uh, like to uh, maintain their tone and be able to speak in, uh, as fluently in the, um, in the gender that they're comfortable with. And that, that's what it is. That's what happens. And that's it. And then people go and they ignore the fact that we already have laws on the books when it comes to children having surgery. Parents have to provide consent. And there has to be a need. There has to be a medical need. Nobody is taking children in the back and dropping off their chopping off their genitals. It just doesn't happen like that. So I just wanted to just provide that and just try to give some normalcy back into it because the things that we're hearing are happening. Thank you. I'm sorry. In the interest of time, we're going to shift to the next topic, which is reproductive rights. We talked about it. We touched on it a little bit. But H uh, House Bill 2264, abortion reversal was vetoed. But this book bill would require doctors and Medicaid and abortion providers to tell their patients that it is possible to reverse an abortion after taking the abortion pill. If a woman changes her mind after taking the abortion pill, can abortion effects be reversed? How does that work? If not, why not? Okay. So medication abortion reversal is unscientific and it's medically unsound. Um, it's just another way for legislators to push misinformation, disinformation, and it's not based in any evidence. Absolutely, it's medically, like scientifically not possible. And it's just another effort to intrude on that patient-provider relationship. And it would penalize doctors um, for refusing to lie to their patients about an unsafe, inaccurate procedure. And even though what's being proposed is unscientific and medically unsound, the legislation <clears throat> the, 
because it requires to tell patients inaccurate information about reversing the medication abortion, it puts patients in danger. And at the end of the day, what this legislation is attempting to do is to put patients in danger. And again, it's just another way to stigmatize abortion care, push misinformation, and interfere in that patient-provider relationship. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, there, there's a lot of talk about counseling centers for alternatives to abortion, basically mm -hmm. crisis pregnancy, uh, pregnancy crisis centers. They sound like centers which offer vulnerable services such as counseling and mentoring and connecting women to health programs. What's wrong with taking advantage of these, these services? So I've worked in the nonprofit sector for 20 years, right? And the services in and of themselves are awesome. And they should be offered to people that need and want them. But when they are attached to anti-abortion organizations, that's where it becomes problematic. Because crisis pregnancy centers, they misinform and they dissuade people from the health care that they need and deserve. And when it comes to the budget, um, Kansas is diverting or is suggesting to divert TANF funds, right? And TANF funds are used for low and moderate income people. And that wasn't the intention of TANF funds, right? And so we have to be, um, we have to be very clear in, you know, speaking to the doctor's point and others on the, on the panel, that oftentimes there are nuggets of good that are meshed in with a lot of bad. And so you have to make difficult decisions about what it is that you want to support. But when it comes to crisis pregnancy centers, in and of themselves, they are heavily um, unregulated. And again, they do not provide the service that they tout that they do. Absolutely. And we have a question about the Born Alive Bill, H uh, House Bill 2313 that was vetoed. And I'll read this from my state uh, legislatures. If in infants are born alive, shouldn't all measures be taken to help them live? Anyone you guys can jump in here. Yeah, and I think that's what happens. But if there's a child who is born who has severe um, issues and you know that they're not going to survive um, because of medical abnormalities or something, um, you're saying that that physician is going to intubate them or do invasive procedures instead of knowing that the outcome of this child is that they're going to die, to let a mother hold that child for the last, for 20 minutes. So yes, they are saving children, but if it is an issue where that child is not going to make it, you are forcing the decision to take this child away from their mother and do invasive, trying to life save, which you know that's not going to be the outcome. Senator Corso. Um, Senate Bill 180 was vetoed, definition of female and male. What's wrong with a narrow definition of male and female? Isn't it a black and white issue with a little gray? Again, I, I just don't think that this is appropriate for the state legislatures. I mean, I'm going to go back to what I said. Uh, I just think that we need to be focused more on kitchen table issues. This is not an issue where the legislature has any particular expertise. That, um, there are all sorts of complexities around human biology and gender and things like that that I can just tell you that my colleagues are not <laughs> are not experts on. Forty-five minutes. All right, then we Let's get checked out. I'll pause the Yeah. <laughs> I need to use the restroom. Yeah. Uh, but no, look, I mean, I, I just think it's it's not an issue that the legislature has any real expertise on. Human biology, we, we learn more about it all the time, is incredibly complicated. And uh, at the end of the day, this is not something that the Kansas State Legislature needs to be dealing with. I mean, I, I think the two most mic-dropping stats are the fact that we continue to, to be among the leading states in terms of college graduates going somewhere else, yeah. and that we continue to lose population. To me, those are the mic drop stats that I would love the legislature to be laser focused on. Mm -hmm. Doing things like the Women's Bill of Rights, it's not gonna help anybody get a job, it's not gonna help your kid get better educated, it's not gonna help you retire with dignity, it's not gonna help a young couple buy their first home. 
It's not going to do anything like that. It's complicated, and we need to just move on to issues that we can have a positive impact on. Yeah. I'd like to add something. Yes. Yeah. Well, go ahead, guys. Can the three of us add? Yeah. On 180, it's exactly what you're saying, Senator Corson. This is a this is a bill. Uh, an issue that's science driven, okay? There's all kinds of science out there. When I first just, you know, worked it out in my mind as a teenager that I was gay, I started reading scientific stuff about, even though at that time it was still considered an illness. I read Masters and Johnson, I read Kinsey at the age of 17, 18, and learned that we are not really binary, you know, like we think we are, okay? I'm not going to go into all that. I'm just saying that's science. That's left up to the scientists. The legislature shouldn't be involved in that. The same thing with the trans sports bill. We have CASHA, Kansas State High School Activities Association. They're there to deal with uh, issues of students, not the legislature, in my opinion. Okay, and that's just all I wanted to add. Appreciate it, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, I, I just wanted to. Uh, I want to say one more time that this is not a cut and dry issue, right? Biology is not cut and dry, as Senator Corson said. Um, but I, I also want to mention there's another community, there's another group of people that the majority party in the legislature is targeting, and it's the religious community, right? It, uh, it's people that of faith, people that have a good will, because they're lying to those people. Mm -hmm. They're playing on their fears. Look at all of the legislation that's been vetoed that we're talking about today. Look at what the legislature has been doing for the last 12 weeks, or the first 12 weeks of session. They're concerned about genitals. Bottom line, they're concerned about genitals. They're concerned about genitals with, uh, with, with trans individuals, in um, abortion rights, because they know that it plays, and they know that it tugs at heartstrings, and they know that well-meaning people will get behind that and will vote. And who will they vote for? They'll vote for the people that are calling for these bans on humans, other humans. So that's, a, that's another group of people that we haven't talked about that are being targeted because we're being given misinformation. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to say about the Women's Bill of Rights, it doesn't give women any additional rights, right? right? It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't offer pay equity, it doesn't <laughs> offer affordable child care, it doesn't even offer us access to the health care that we want and that we voted for, right? It doesn't give women the right to either grow or start their family. And so when they, when they, when they talk about the Women's Bill of Rights, it's infuriating because you, you're using it to weaponize women's rights against trans people. That's all you're doing. Absolutely, and I wanted to ask Courtney if you wanted to uh, join in on this. No, I think you were getting ready to step okay. in there. I, wanted to I was to just gonna say, this is kind of the overall arching thing. There are people closest to the constituents who are dealing with these, whether it's a physician that you are doing, or a local government, or Keisha, or the school board. And what it is, is there is a handful of legislators who do not like the decisions that those people who are closest and who know the intricacies of that transgender child in the school who may or may not be open to the rest of the school or that decision in the um, doctor's room, that discussion. Those are very personal and intricate and um, in the gray area but you have a group of people who do not like it and they know that they're on the wrong side of these issues, whether it's reproductive rights or whatever, and they're trying to control this, so they're trying to pass legislation to have that final say because they don't like where Kansans' voices are being heard. And we're, we're, we're getting down to the end of this uh, deal. And uh, I did want to uh, bring up one more topic that's been going on in the state legislature, and that's trying to outlaw and ban diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Aren't these initiatives just another way to keep conservative viewpoints out of higher education and behavioral science? And shouldn't all perspectives be welcome? Let's talk about this war on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of you guys mentioned this in your opening, like, who's against anti-discrimination training? <laughs> Feel free to jump in. 
Well, I mean, I will say this from just a perspective, just to kind of put this into how I think this would play out in, in sort of in practice. This is the, the budget piece dealt with higher education. So I went to Garden City Community College in Southwest Kansas. And if you go to Garden City High School, there are dozens of different languages being spoken. There are so many students there who are first generation, first generation college, first generation Americans. It is an incredibly diverse population. And so it is crazy to me that you would be hiring a potential, or you'd be interviewing a potential dean of students, and you would be prohibited by the Kansas legislature from asking the question, have you, do you have any experience educating diverse students? I mean, think about that. That is crazy for Garden City to be barred by law from asking a potential dean of students candidate do you have any experience working with diverse student populations? Yeah. Great point. Anyone else want to chime in? Well, look at Wyandotte County, where we have no one race or ethnic group uh, dominant over the other in the in the in numbers. Okay, it's it's truly a, a really diverse county, and we have somebody told me eighty or more languages spoken in the Kansas City, Kansas public school district. And now you're seeing that down in Southwest Kansas with the immigration of, uh, and refugees moving in there and other places in Kansas, other places in Missouri. I've been associated with diversity education. I worked for the IRS for 35 years and I was involved in it there. We had a book called Workforce 2000 that talked about, here's the bottom line, and a lot of companies know it, diversity is good business, okay? It makes business sense. And why isn't the legislature acting, as some of you have already said, to make Kansas a business-friendly, diversity-friendly place? Because it, all it can do is make people more successful, in my opinion. Before we uh, turn it over to Connie, anybody want to add anything else about the diversity, equity, and inclusion and the tax on that from the state? Uh, you said it. Like, who, who would want to? Who would want to ban diversity training? Who would want to ban anti-racism training? Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to chime in there briefly if I may. Yes. I mean, to Doc's point over here, like the cultural humility training that we do that, that, that impacts health outcomes again, because we know that we all have implicit bias. We know that we all have that, the way we are raised and who we are, and it comes out as explicit bias. But, you know, as an MPH student in epidemiology at KU Med, we're required to do that training every single year. You know, how would you like a surgeon that did one appendectomy and that's all they ever did? Good luck with that. You know, it's that constant, it's that perishable skill set where you always have to keep working on. Having that block, again, upstream, downstream, right, again, creates another issue where we're going to see downstream effects from a health impact if we block that DEI, the culture of belonging and inclusion, and, and have the, because again, that's what, that's what cultural humility training is and allows us to just be better. Absolutely. Great. We'll bring Connie back up. other yeah. bills that we didn't get to talk about. Um, one is was the three-day grace period, which is a very important voting rights bill. Um, flat tax, another one. I think these will be coming uh, away from governor's desk and back to the legislature as well, hopefully with vetoes. I know that um, there's some controversy about flat tax and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Alright, so we'll, we'll have to, you know, make sure we stay within their time frame. But if, if uh, anyone wants to quickly talk a little bit about three-day grace period or flat tax, um, feel free. Yeah. So I was actually the one who carried the three-day grace period um, in 2017 on the Senate floor, and it passed overwhelmingly. Um, but again, there are people who do not like, you know, counting those uh, well, I will just say, we had a senator who said voting is a privilege, and it is not a right. And when that is your mentality, um, you're up against odds. And he 
So this is like Patrick Mahomes throwing the touchdown, and we were waiting. And I'm like, well, actually, we do wait because if it's past his hand in the time before the, the clock stops, we wait to see if they catch that. That is what happens. You know, if you have that your ballot postmarked by 7 o'clock on election night, and it's received within three days, it counts. It's that pass. So it is a right, but trying to take it away from a certain part of our population. Connie, if I may. Yeah. And just to clarify what you said when you carried the three-day grace period, we didn't have that in Kansas before 2017. So it was at 7 p.m. Right. on election day that your ballot had to be in no matter what. So. So uh, Leader Sykes in 2017 championed a bill that added that three-day grace period and it passed with overwhelming support, bipartisan support. And, and now that's what they're trying to take away, that grace period, because of, you know, what if the post office is running late? That never happens, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, what, I mean, what if some unforeseen circumstance happens in your life and you don't get to mail that ballot until the last minute on, you know, the last minute you can on, on Monday? right before the mail goes out. That's who that protects. It protects our right to vote. So thank I, you I much. do think we are in a pretty strong position in terms of sustaining that veto. So in the House, you need 84 to override a veto on the House. That bill got 76, so they were significantly short, and it got 23 in the Senate, and you would need 27 in the Senate to override. So I feel like we're in a strong position on keeping the three-day grace period. And that kind of brings us to, as community members, what can we do? What can we do um, to help uh, our governor sustain these vetoes on some of these uh, horrendous bills? Uh, and what can we do to um, bolster uh, the support of our legislators on these bills? And Jay Boyer is going to talk a little bit about that. Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah, I know. As the timekeeper, I understand how important it is we get out before the library closes. So, uh, My name is Jay Moyer, and I'm the engagement coordinator for Mainstream Coalition, so I work with Michael. Um, first, I wanted to thank Connie um, and the Voting Rights Network of Wyandotte County for putting this on, and for all of these expert panelists, because these have been very enlightening um, conversations that we've had today. I was very very pleased that we were able to bring to light some of the dark things that the legislature is doing that I get to watch through a little YouTube video on my screen. Um, so as the engagement coordinator, it is my job to tell you how to be engaged. Um, so first, the easiest way is to sign up for alerts from Mainstream Coalition and from the Voting Rights Network. If you look on that back table, all the resources are back there. Not the one with the coffee, the one with the papers. <laughs> um, we have our QR code for Mainstream Coalition. If you scan that, you can become a member. It's as easy as $35 a month, or uh, sorry, a year. <laughs> yeah, that one might get a little bit. Do the month. month. You <laughs> could do the month if you wanted to. <laughs> um, so become a member. You'll get our um, inclusive member emails that outline in detail everything that we are following in the legislature as we. Um, fight extremism. And then um, I know the Voting Rights Network also has a sign-up sheet back there, so you can go sign up um, to get their alerts. Um, I also, there are some of these from the ACLU of Kansas um, that will take you to their page to sign up for their action alerts. Um, you know, I think it's good to be pl as plugged into as many of these organizations as possible because I know since I'm the only one running our Twitter page, I don't catch every single thing that happens in the legislature, so um, a good list um, of all of those organizations. Do you say it's on this one? Uh, well, Voter Rights is. Yeah, Voter, uh, Voter Rights has a QR code down here. Um, but following Mainstream, Voter Rights Network, ACLU of Kansas, Equality Kansas, Planned Parenthood, Loud Light. If you don't remember all of these, Sign I'll make sure. Sign up for your legislators' Sign up emails. To, for your legislators' emails. Subscribe. Subscribe. <laughs> All right. This is not a paid promotion. Follow that subscription up. You don't have to be a member to get our alerts. Oh, that's so true. So you, yeah. you can scan that code. It'll take you to our site, and you can sign up for alerts as well. So following as many of these organizations in the Kansas City Star as possible <laughs> is a, a first great way to be plugged into what the legislature is doing. Um, 
Voter Rights Network has also put together a public testimony outline. So if, um, come next year, if you're following some, I'm assuming similar legislation that might not make it through this year, good luck, um, that will be brought back and you want to have your voice heard on that legislation, the Voting Rights Network has made it very easy if you pick up one of these on the back table to contact your legislators and they outline how to do that and kind of what you should be saying in those messages. So always emailing your legislators and submitting public testimony on some of these bills as they go through committees is another, is a second great way to get involved. And then lastly, um, if you sign up for action alerts from organizations like Mainstream, ACLU, Voting Rights Network, Planned Parenthood, and I will say Loud Light, um, even though they aren't represented here today, um, we host things like phone banks, and that's why I bring up Loud Light is because they do phone banks where we call legislators um, and we call people within the district to let them know about what's going on. And our organizations always work together to promote those type of advocacy efforts as well. Um, I also do want to plug for anyone who's going to come down to Johnson County on Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Mainstream Coalition will be partnering with the, um, the League of Women Voters of Johnson County to host a similar event to this um, with partners from other advocacy organizations as well. So if you are available, um, you can sign up for that online and that will be hybrid both over Zoom and in person. So those are a bunch of great, great ways to get involved. If you have any questions, reach out to any of these lovely people or reach out to Connie. And um, I gotta rush out of here, but if you find me online, reach out to me there as well. I'm always open. I'll leave it to Connie to close. Thank you, Jay. Uh, we have one or two more quick announcements. Uh, one from Robert Gibson, who is going to talk a little bit about the Medicaid expansion uh, efforts. Thank you. <coughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. I promise I'll be very, very quick. Um, how many people in here are aware of Medicaid unwinding happening right now in Kansas? Okay, good, good. That's a good amount of people. I'm glad. That actually makes me feel uh, good inside that you know about that. So um, I won't spend too much longer, but as you know, Medicaid unwinding is happening here in Kansas, um, across the country, um, obviously, but here in Kansas. Um, it started in March. Uh, the letters started to go out for renewals. We're, I just wanted to say a brief word, uh, and I appreciate, Connie, the opportunity. Um, as we continue to fight for kin care expansion here in the state of Kansas, we want to make sure we're not going backwards as we try to go forwards. Um, as we try to go forward, excuse me. So we want to make sure that everyone knows about updating their address. Um, you can do that through the chat box on the care or the care chat box on the Can Care website. There's also um, numbers that you can call for Edna, um, the Sunflower, and also United Healthcare. Um, we have fl a flyer that we can share if you want to distribute that. And then, uh, last but not least, there's local organizations who have partnered with us through the CHIP, the uh, Wanda County Community Health Improvement Plan. Not the Children's Health Improvement Plan. We have so many acronyms here. <laughs> in public health. Um, but the CHIP is related to Medicaid, so that is important, the Children's Health Insurance Plan. But in specifically, excuse me, here in WANDOT, we have the Community Health Improvement Plan, and we've organized a campaign around Medicaid, unwinding and re-enrollment that Connie has been helping us uh, get the word about. And so she just wanted to give, allow me a, a brief moment. I asked her just to make sure I shared that here. And then last but not least, um, we've been partnering with the Alliance for a Healthy Kansas. Um, which is a national, I mean, I'm sorry, a statewide organization um, committed to advocacy issues here in Kansas. And so they ask anyone who is uninsured or been affected by Medicaid and wine, and if you want to share your story, there's flyers in the back of you can do that. All right. Thank you so much. One more quick announcement. Uh, Judy Thank you, Connie. This is a great program. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Cross Border Network, and also I'm um, Mayor Garner's labor liaison. And um, I just want to bring your attention back to the bill that I asked Melissa or Pesa about, House Bill 2350. The governor has till Monday to veto this bill, and I want to ask all of you to call the governor's office and ask her to veto 20, 2350. Her number, if you have a pencil, I also made a bunch of these handouts while, we, while I was listening. I, her number is 785-368-8500.
this bill is so poorly drafted that I think probably Chris Kobach wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> it leaves, a, it, it casts a huge net. For instance, I do wage theft investigations uh, because immigrants, undocumented immigrants in particular, are victims of wage theft all the time. If I let one of those immigrants buy me a cup of coffee, I could be accused of trafficking uh, while I was talking to him. Homeless shelters who might use uh, somebody who stays there who's undocumented as a volunteer to clean up or something, they could be accused of trafficking. Churches, which provide sanctuary, same thing. I mean, yeah, the, the list of ways in which this bill could be misused are really is really long. It's so bad. I mean, one thing we all hate trafficking, I imagine, especially sex trafficking, and that's what most people think, but that's not what this bill is gonna do. It's a real violation of not just immigrants' rights and immigrant families' rights, it's a violation of our rights too if we wanna be a good Samaritan and pick somebody up and give them a ride and they might give us gas, gas money. Um, and besides that, the police, let alone citizens, how do we know if somebody's undocumented? You have to go to law school to learn immigration law and it's changing every day. So I really urge you, please call the governor or email her, uh, her webpage and please tell her to veto this bill. It's House Bill 2350 and the phone number 785-386-8500. Thank you very much. Anybody want a phone number? I want to thank everyone uh, today for participating in our veto session convo. Thank you legislators, thank you experts, thank you to our volunteers and our helpers, thank you to our partners. We hope everyone is a little bit more informed than when you arrive. I know I am. Please feel free to join our activism efforts as we work to monitor and advocate on legislation that impacts our counties, both of them, and our state. Indicate, please, that you'd like more information on the sign-up sheet in the back, and our website is www.voterrightsnetwork.org. Um, all of these bills deserve your opinion. Uh, to the governor, to the, your legislators uh, in trying to sustain the vetoes on this really horrible legislation that is going to be taken up next week. So uh, please, please weigh in. Uh, that's what our organization is all about. We would love to have your support. Thanks again so much. Have a wonderful Saturday.